Hi team, Justin Zeltzer here from zstatistics.com doing you a little bit of health stats education today from my bedroom in quarantine. It's called Health Stats IQ and hopefully you're going to find this uh, somewhat educational. It's about a whole bunch of terms and concepts that are critical to health statistics. And I'm going to try to relate them all to coronavirus data to keep it relevant. So if you want to see all the videos in the series, you can check out zstatistics.com or I'll put a link to the playlist in the description of this video. So without further ado, let's head straight into confounding, shall we? So let's jump straight into a scenario before we even deal with the definition. Let's just say you're a doctor who's interested in trying to figure out why there are so many people coming in for sunburn to your hospitals. So the first question you might ask yourself is, well, what's causing all of these sunburn presentations? And imagine this, imagine you found that on all of the days where you had a huge amount of sunburn presentations in the emergency department, you also found that ice cream sales were up in those same days. Now, as silly as this sounds, there's probably going to be some strong link between the number of ice cream sales on a particular day and the amount of sunburn presentations you would see at the emergency department. Now, I'm guessing you're probably going to be figuring out what's going on here. It's actually not the ice cream sales that's affecting the sunburn presentations, obviously, but there's this additional variable which we can call sun exposure, which is affecting both the ice cream sales and the sunburn presentations. And that, my friends, is what a confounding variable is. So the precise definition of a confounding variable is, well, here we say a confounder influences both the dependent variable and independent variable, causing a spurious association. We've got the sun exposure, which is influencing the amount of ice cream sales that's occurring. And it's also influencing the number of sunburn presentations you have at hospital. So if you actually ignored this confounding variable, you've got yourself what is clearly a spurious association between ice cream sales and sunburn presentations. So I like to think of this as like the variable that's working behind the scenes, kind of pulling the strings of the relationship between the two variables of interest. So sun exposure here is sort of pulling the strings of the relationship between ice cream sales and sunburn presentations. Now, as simple as that example is, it's obviously a little bit silly, but I'm hoping to give you the intuition behind what's happening. So now when we apply it to a legitimate public health concern, there have been several studies that have looked at the effect of urban density on the incidence of cardiovascular disease. Now, the theory might be that the greater the urban density, the more sort of fumes that everyone's breathing in from roads, the more stress people are experiencing, the less fresh air, you would think all of these factors would go into increasing the amount of cardiovascular disease. But these studies actually tend to find that the opposite is true. People who live in high urban density settings tend to have lower incidence of cardiovascular disease. So, what's going on? Well, in this case, we have to consider the possibility of a confounding variable such as socioeconomic status that might be the cause of this observed relationship. So I think certainly over the last 20, 25 years, the higher socioeconomic status people tend to congregate in the urban centres. And we also know that the higher socioeconomic status demographics tend to have lower incidence of cardiovascular disease. So it's this confounder which is kind of pulling the strings of the relationship between urban density and cardiovascular disease. And you'd have to look out for that if you're going to do any kind of analysis or research based on urban density causing cardiovascular disease. All right, so let's move on and see how confounding might influence our analysis of COVID-19 data. This should be pretty interesting. We know that the mortality rate for males is a lot higher than it is for females. Now this 2.8 and 1.7% comes from the early stages of the Chinese data that came through. Uh, but this is very much replicated in Italian data and throughout the world, in fact. I'll put some references in the description of the video. So clearly there's going to be an effect of sex on the mortality rate. And we could try to quantify that if we want. But wait, before we do that, let's have a look at something interesting. 
This here is the population pyramid for males and females throughout the world. Now you've got your age groups down the center line here. And you can see that as we get older, there's actually less people in the world at those older age groups. Now here's the thing. We all know that COVID-19 is not affecting everyone equally. It's affecting the older age groups primarily. In fact, the mortality rate is almost exclusively coming from these upper age groups, particularly 80 and above. Now, if we just focus in on the age groups 80 and above, you'll notice that there are way more females in those age groups than there are males. In fact, there are almost two times as many women above the age of 80 alive in the world than there are males, which is pretty interesting. All that considered, if the virus was affecting men and women equally, we'd expect a higher mortality rate for women, purely because they're overrepresented in those higher risk age groups. So the fact that we actually have men with a higher mortality rate means that really this virus must be seriously impacting men more than women. So let's see if we can analyze this through the notion of confounding. You can see that age has to be a confounder because it's related to sex, given what we just found from the population pyramid, but it's also very much related to the probability of mortality. So what does this mean for the actual analysis of this data? Well, you might be tempted using these mortality rates to create what's called a male risk ratio, which is just taking this 2.8 and then dividing by the 1.7 to try to get an impression of the relative risk a male faces compared to a female. So men have 1.65 times the risk of mortality as women might from this virus. But then again, that's just using these raw figures which don't take into account the confounding. If we were to take into account the confounding, we'd actually find a value here which is much larger. So the male risk ratio is confounded here by age, and it's likely to be even higher than this 1.65 figure. How much higher? Well, we can only guess at this stage, but we might need another statistical technique called standardization, which conveniently is another video in this series. So you can pop along to that to find out how we can modify this crude risk ratio to incorporate confounding. So I hope you can see that confounding is not just an issue where it creates a spurious association, but it can also bias some kind of quantity or effect size that we're seeking. So let's move on to the next section where we look at confounding by indication. Now this is used in a specific scenario when we're prescribing a treatment and expecting some kind of, well, hopefully positive health outcome from that treatment. Now the word indication in health sciences has a particular meaning and that is uh, an indication is a valid reason to provide a given treatment. If you're being prescribed heart medication, an indication might be that you are of a certain age group, you have high blood pressure and maybe even heart arrhythmia or something like that. But these would be all indications for prescribing heart medication treatment. Now, confounding by indication means that the reason we prescribed the treatment in the first place is probably going to predict a poorer health outcome afterwards. So the people that are being prescribed treatment are not the healthiest people. In fact, they're by definition probably going to be less healthy than those we don't prescribe the treatment to. So if you're purely doing a comparison between health outcomes from those prescribed the treatment, versus those who weren't prescribed the treatment, you might find that the people in your data set prescribed the treatment are actually doing worse. But that's not because the treatment's ineffective, it's due to this confounding by indication. So it's very much the same thing as normal confounding, it's just there's no real variable here that's doing the confounding, it's this kind of vague indication. So the classic example here um, is one done in the UK from 2004, so a while ago now, but nonetheless still uh, very much relevant. So maternal death in childbirth is rare in developed countries, but it's still there. And clearly it's something that health authorities the world over would be very, very concerned with and something you'd want to devote a lot of resources to investigate. Now, there's a lot of research looking into the effect of caesarean sections on the likelihood of maternal death. 
And in particular, if there's something going wrong in the pregnancy, will the cesarean section actually improve the chance of maternal survival? So even though a cesarean section is widely regarded as a necessary resort when the mother's life's in danger and can actually save her life, it's tough to tease this out in the data because of this confounding by indication. So think about what types of indications there might be for an emergency cesarean section. What factors might be influencing the decision of uh, the patient or the doctor to go for a cesarean section? Well, here are some. There could be a hypertensive disease experienced by the mother, uh, an infection. We also know that mothers of advanced maternal age are more likely to have cesarean sections. In extreme circumstances, if the mother's suffering cardiac arrest, there might be an emergency cesarean section done as well. Or just generally, poor maternal health might lend itself to a cesarean section as well. So I hope you can see that all of these factors are influencing the decision to take the cesarean section in the first place, but they also affect the probability of maternal death because they indicate in each of those situations uh, a poorer health starting point from the mother's point of view. So very much more likely to cause a maternal death themselves. So this study from 2004 found that mothers who gave birth by cesarean section were 4.3 times as likely to die in childbirth than those that didn't have a cesarean section. So if you were just looking at those figures without considering that confounding, you might think that, wow, cesarean sections cause a huge spike in risk for maternal death. But in reality, it's probably very likely that a lot of lives are saved by choosing a cesarean section when the mother's life is on the line. At the very least, it makes this very difficult to study. And that's really the conclusion of this paper, which I'll put a link to again in the notes. So finally, we're going to have a look at confounding and RCTs, which is randomized control trials. So in the previous examples, we've been looking at what's called retrospective studies, where you have the data and you try to analyze the effects of one variable on another variable. Control trials are prospective studies. So what happens is you have this desired intervention for some kind of health issue. So you're hoping that it creates some kind of positive health outcome. Now what happens with RCTs is that you randomize people into an intervention group and a control group. So what happens then is if you have a confounder, which in theory might be affecting the likelihood of intervention as well as the health outcome itself, by randomizing what happens is you actually break this arrow here no longer is the confounder associated with the intervention if you randomize. So if you're looking at, say, the effect of exercise on longevity, you might have a confounder, which is to say that people who are more health-minded will be exercising more, and maybe it's not the exercise that's giving them the longevity. Maybe it's just their general health consciousness that's doing that. They probably eat better and they smoke less and all these kinds of things. But if you randomize people into the exercise group, so you just say, you guys exercise, you guys sit on your ass for three weeks. If you do that, you're actually making sure that the healthy people the, or the health-minded people are evenly split amongst the exercise group and the couch potatoes. But I will say there's still the possibility of confounding within RCTs. And that happens only if, let's just say you happen to randomize more healthy people into one group than another group. You can still get confounding by sort of random chance, but it's certainly a much lower risk of biasing your analyses. So that's it. I hope you've enjoyed that deep dive into confounding. My name is Justin Zeltzer. This is zstatistics.com. If you like what I do, please subscribe to the channel and you'll be kept up to date with all these additional health stats videos along with any other things that I'm doing. Um, I tend to do a lot of other different things on this channel. But if you wanted to do something for me, you can hit the like button and subscribe and do all those kind of things and show a friend as well, someone that might be interested in health data. And in the meantime, stay safe, wash your hands regularly and call your loved ones. Hope you're doing all right. <laughs>